Welcome to the 79th episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome second time guest to the show, Joel Haber. Joel, welcome back to the show. Great to be here in person. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, so previously we had, I don't even think it was Zoom, I think we Skyped. That episode. It may have been, yeah. Yeah, that was way was, yeah. back in the pre Zoom. Pre history of this show. <laughs> pre, this pre, of the show, right. This show had a lot of Skypes in, before transitioning uh, in, in 2020 to Zoom. So, uh, this is our first time getting together, so I'm, I'm really excited about this. And of course, we are even not only just getting together in person, we are actually drinking together. So, Lachaim, we've got some sours. So, Lachaim, everybody. Talk about this. Maybe we'll talk about these guys behind us here also. Yes. So and we, we'll talk about the place we're sitting in. Yes. Yeah, so, despite the, the background, we are actually not at Milk and Honey, but we're going to get to that. We have, uh, we are actually, for those interested, we are sitting at a place called Beer Atinu, our beer, it's also known as the Jerusalem Beer Center, is that yeah, right? Yeah, this is, this is really, it's right in the heart of downtown Jerusalem, and this is the place for craft beer in Jerusalem. It is uh, a bottle shop, it is a bar slash restaurant, uh, and it's also a homebrew supply store, so anybody who's a homebrewer in this area, they know to come here and get their stuff, so it's a really great place. And a little later, we're also going to talk about like some of the stuff that the owner of this place does, because he's one of the crazy minds of beer in Israel. Yes. Yes. Genius of you. Well, yeah. A, and by the way, ingenuitive, uh, and by the way, you're, you're right when you say yeah. that beer attainment means our beer, but it's also a pun. Did you know this? Our, our capital, right? Exactly. Yes. Because bira. Shushan habira. Right. So a bira is both a beer, a bira, and mm -hmm. it's also the capital, Jerusalem, our capital. So it's yes. a, like nice it little It works, yeah. Absolutely. So, for those less familiar with Joel, even though he's a, been a previous guest on the show, he is a tour guide based right here, at least where we're recording in Jerusalem. And uh, anything else you'd like to share with us, Joel? Yeah, I mean, so the way we first got in touch was because I'm also, I do a lot of research on Jewish food history. Uh, within the broader Jewish food history realm, I have done a lot of research on Jews and alcohol, actually just about, I think it was about three weeks ago, I did a, a program right here, an event here, oh, yeah. where I gave a whole lecture about the history of Jews and alcohol with different drinks mixed in throughout the night and also fun. food and stuff. So yeah, it was it was it was a good time. Had a good turnout. Yeah, it was a great event. Um, and and I may as well. Yeah, yeah. Plug so myself. I'm I'm gonna share this. All right, you go so ahead. So right now, well, as of this recording, and hopefully by the time of this publishing, uh, in the works is a proposed. Uh, trip, a, a, a collaborative between Jews and Booze, a Facebook group, also the subject of episode 77 of the Jewish Drinking Show and, uh, and Jewish Drinking. And Joel right here uh, will be the tour guide for hopefully March 2022. Two. This coming March. Hopefully. Pandemic permitting, of course, but it's, you know, plans are in the works. Yeah, we are, we're definitely in the planning already and we've moved quite a ways, but uh, yes, hopefully that will happen. Yeah. I also wanted to plug myself to also. Absolutely. For in much sooner than two months, uh, well, I don't know when this is going to air. Two months from now, November. October, November. <laughs> this may maybe after that, and if so, or maybe it actually out. it could be during. Right, but uh, I'm making a trip to the states to do a speaking tour all about uh, Jewish food history, including this talk that I've done. If people are interested in that, so if anybody sees this beforehand and is interested in either booking me or during and wants to see where I'm speaking. Then uh, my website, tasteofjew.com. Nice, nice. Okay, awesome. And I'll put that in the show notes for anybody interested. Yeah. Alrighty, so the topic of our episode today is talking about how the pandemic has affected, I think, booze in general in Israel. Yeah, the Israeli alcohol industry. I'd say. Right, yeah. Right. And so obviously that affects, we're talking about beer, whiskey behind us, you know, wine is a, is a mainstay, but these are not the only beverages you can find in Israel or, for that matter, have been affected by the pandemic. What I would say, if I wanted to summarize in a nutshell, one of the big things we'll see, and it's not only here, was pivoting. There was a lot of pivoting going on. Big word of 2020, and in and 2021, 2021, as it has, yes, <laughs> as it has continued. So I mean, let's start. You know, well, play, play with the home field with advantage. I was going to say yeah. beer, beer atino. But like specifically this beer, uh, which is which is uh, made by beer atino. Yep. It's uh, it's a hoppy sour, so it's a sour beer with added hops. So it's got a little bit of this to it. What well, I was going to say, this is not directly related to COVID, but it sort of took place during COVID. I'd say or it kicked off. All the trends that are in beers, craft beers around the world, they happen worldwide everywhere. 
but usually they'll start in places like America. And so we're usually a few years behind. I know, I know sour beers have been huge in America for a while. Yep. Our first sour beer, to my knowledge, was made by, uh, by Hash, who I will talk a little bit about later. Um, an American, uh, Ephraim, uh, from Long Island. He's got a nice restaurant on the shook called Hatch. Open another restaurant called Schmaltz. Uh, Schmaltz. But point was, that, if I'm not mistaken, he was the first sour beer in Israel. And then you, uh, there, I could be mistaken about that, but certainly there was no, no well-known ones. Mm -hmm. And that was probably, I would guess, three to four years ago that he came out. Okay. I think the next one that people saw, and the biggest one, was put out by Shapira, who I'll also talk about later, a strong sour beer. But now, on the shelves, there's, there's, there's got to be, not tons, but there's probably about five, six, seven different sours out there now. So, it's become known. Oh, well, that's good. And I think that that's something not about Corona again, but it's worth understanding about the Israeli beer industry. When people say, like, what's different about the Israeli beer industry, one of the things is that because you know that Israelis are famous travelers. Yes. Anywhere you go in the world. I was in Alaska and in the airport I looked next to an Israeli. No joke. Like literally sitting right next to the airport, okay? So because of this passion for travel, it also broadens Israelis' palates. Mm. And so they're more adventurous tasters. And so when you go into a beer in most places around the world, a bar in most places around the world, you have kind of like multiple versions of the same type of beer, okay? Uh -huh. And a few others. You'll have like a whole bunch of lagers or a whole bunch of like English bitters or whatever it is. Here you go into a regular bar. I mean a good bar. A regular bar is just going to have like three beers that are all the same. <laughs> but like whatever. You go into like a good bar yeah. and there's going to be on tap an IPA and a wheat and a lager and, a, and an ale and a stout. And, yeah. and then there will also sometimes be some of these more adventurous ones. Mm -hmm. So that's something cool. And so this is, I think, a testament to that. Okay. Coffee sour. Okay, so you know I, I met the other night the the brewer here at, at Beer Team Schmoltz, and he was telling he was telling me that they used to have a lot more in person stuff, but owing to the pandemic, they've transitioned or pivoted to a lot more packaged goods, bottles especially. Right. So I imagine a lot of breweries have also been doing that throughout the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, well, we'll start with Beer Team, and then I'll talk about some of the others. Yeah. But uh, obviously. Um, when you don't have people coming in, and, and these guys got hurt, you know, they, they own a few places, and one of their bars closed down during the, the, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They reopened a number of months later in a different location, but that was, that was a tough thing for them. Yeah. And so, um, one of the ways that they tried to make sure that people were constantly coming in to get more beers, like in bottles, yeah. was they were constantly cranking out new beers. Oh, wow. So that the, the passionate people who are the home brewers and stuff like that, and the people like me, who I'm not a home brewer, but I love beer, yeah. they would be coming back all the time to get the newest thing. So I actually have a bunch here. The thing you have to understand about this place, so Schmoltz, the, the guy who he was talking about, the brewer and, and co-owner here, he's like a freak with his beers. He makes weird, adventurous things. He'll throw anything into a beer. They had a, they had a beer, um, during uh, right around Hanukkah time, that was yeah. like a Sufganiya flavored, uh, <laughs> a jelly donut flavored beer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just grabbed four of the out there ones. Yeah, to show you. First one is the least out there. Okay. okay? Yeah. Um, but it also answers another question that I often ask people: like when you come to Israel and you get Israeli wine, yeah. so the grapes were grown here and it's made here. Right. You get a really good sense of the terroir. Right. But with beer, like. Virtually nobody's using malt grains from that this are country. Grown in Israel. Hops can't even grow in this country. So what makes an Israeli and, and, and the beer? yeast and also the yeast? Where you well, yeast. well, theoretically, ye there you are could yeast get from the yeah. granny or the whatever. But like those things for sure. So what makes an Israeli beer an Israeli beer? Well, one of the things there's a few, but one of the things is a lot of brewers are putting in local flavors. Okay, I think so, I see water. <laughs> <laughs> now, so this beer here. For those uh, getting to watch this, okay. so it's got a weird uh, typeface on there, but you're going to know immediately what it's flavored with because it's called Chalvale. Chalva beer? This is a oh, Chalva right. beer. I mean, it's definitely uh, very cloudy. It is not a clear beer. That is right. Clear. And so that's the, the, the most tame of the weird ones okay, <laughs> uh, that they made this year. And it's 4.5% alcohol. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
That's fine. This one, which also has a, 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 a cool Ooh. painted wrapper. They have the original painting. They printed this, so it's a piece of art. It comes with your beer. Wow, right? that's awesome. It's this one. It's called Melnick. It is an imperial pastry stout, uh, bitam with the flavor yeah. of Belgian waffle, caramel, <laughs> and blueberry. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so that's this. That's fascinating. That's by the way, twelve and a half percent alcohol. That's well, it's an imperial, so yeah. Yeah, that's that's a, it's not a light one. Yep. Yeah. This one is the weirdest one, which uh, you tried recently, and I, also I had it the other it. night. Yeah. Yeah. This. Uh, isn't officially under the Beratana label, it's under Schmoltz's private label. You can see right over here it says Schmoltz. For those who are watching instead of listening, for those who are listening will pay attention. You'll take our word for it. This <laughs> is a mushroom beer. Yep. Now, what did you think of it when you had it? So, first of all, I, it's only the second mushroom beer I've ever had in my life. First one I've ever had. There's, there are certainly not many of it. I, I will say also it's an imperial. It's not just a mushroom beer, it's an imperial roasted mushroom stein beer. And am I speaking with the brewer the other night about even just the stein, forgive me the mushrooms. Stein beer, he told me, the way that they brewed it is you have to put the whole mixture, the brew stuff, in a wooden pot. Yeah. But you can't directly apply the fire to wood if you're trying to brew, right? You can certainly do it if you want to create a fire. That's, right. that's great. So you have to use the intermediary of stones. That's why it's called a stein ah. beer. So you use stones to heat it up. So you right. heat the it says stones. Here, 5G stoned imperial well, roasted Well, 5G mushrooms. stoned is the name of the beer. Right. But the style, so a stein beer, you have to do that with the stones. So you heat the stones. I, I don't remember if you then apply them to the wood or you put them in the beer directly. But either way, that's the stein beer aspect. And it's imperial. So ro roasted mushrooms. You put roasted mushrooms in it. So it has this this um, uh, earthy, mushroomy flavor yeah, to it. You definitely get the mushrooms. It's very earthy. Yes. I, frankly, I didn't and, love it, but it was definitely interesting. And all at the same time, it's also imperial. It's ten point two percent. So it is a. There's a lot going on. It's certainly look. There are not many mushroom beers out there. It's certainly an interesting one. If you're not expecting a mushroom beer, that earthiness is going to get you. But it's not overpowering earthiness. Like it's there, but it's 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 still. I I may or may not have had a second one. <laughs> it was now, good. Now you're not Russian background by any chance, are you? Um, Russian Polish. I, the border okay. changed. Mm. Well, this one, <laughs> this one, which is the last one I'll show you of Beratinos, this actually comes from a, a Russian idea. So this one is called Apochmen. Okay. And this, the concept behind it, if I tell you what it is, came from. You've heard the term "hair of the dog," of course. Yes. So this is the Russian hair of the dog, ah, but in a bottle already. Clever. Pickle flavored beer. Ah. Okay, now this is a sour beer. Was it a ghost? Made it's, I think it is a goza, yeah, if you yeah. can look, I think so. Yeah. It's definitely a sour style beer, but it has yeah. in it cucumber, yeah. dill, yeah, it's a goza garlic, yeah, yeah, it is a goza, yeah. Yeah, three and a half percent, yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you, it doesn't taste like a pickle, but it tastes good. I actually like so I've wow. bought this multiple times again, it's in my fridge right now, Ooh, actually. Wow. I like it. <laughs> like, I don't think the flavors blend in the way it does inside of a pickle, but you taste cucumber, you taste dill, you taste garlic. Oh, that does sound refreshing. And it tastes sour. It sounds it's refreshing. It's super nice, yeah. yeah. And it's got a hilarious label. Yeah, oh, actually the artwork of all the labels of, of these smoked ones are very yes. colorful. So that's <laughs> so that's a bunch of the of the ones from this place. Yes. Um, quickly we'll run through a whole bunch of others because I know we got all, lots of things done. So I'm just gonna throw out a bunch of different yeah. things and talk about how they changed along the way. Um, so, uh, oh, actually I'll say something that these guys did also that we don't have a bottle here from, but also what, what Beer Bazaar, Beer Bazaar did, who are like sort of like the main uh, Israeli craft beer place in the country. Mm -hmm. Whereas this place has Israeli craft beers and non-Israeli craft beers. Beer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, excuse me, beer Bazaar is totally it's Israeli Exclusively beers. Israeli beers. Okay. And Israeli craft beers, no mainstream, no Gold Star uh, Maccabi, stuff like that. So they in particular, obviously they, they have lots of like locations around the country, what they focused on and, and very successfully was shifting into a delivery model. Online uh, delivery, people order online, and they actually developed their own software that now I think they're selling to other places also wow. to manage the logistics of, so now like you can order yeah. anywhere in the country more or less I think and get it within like less than a day or something like that, or a wow. day, or a day. Okay? That's quite the pivot. So yeah, and so now they still have locations, but a big part of their business is now online. Yeah. And 
they like these guys also continue to come out with new beers all the time to also encourage people to buy more. Yeah. Um, one of the most recent ones, and this is another example of what makes an Israeli beer an Israeli beer. Sure. They just came out about two weeks ago with this uh, pineapple flavored elf that um, is dedicated to the memory of a woman who died in a car crash, mm. uh, who was a big fan of the beer bazaar. Yeah. And she donated organs and saved, I think, five people's lives oh, after, nice. she, after she unfortunately passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if they're donating money from the sale or at least, but at the very least, they are promoting the Organ Donor Society on the bottles themselves and mentioning this woman and everything like that. So that's a beer with a social conscience, which we have a number of like that also, which I that's think is nice. awesome. Yeah, that's really nice. So, um, and uh, Biratena was doing a lot of deliveries in the beginning also for the same thing. Yeah. Now, Hatch, which is, as we mentioned before, um, one of the things that they did during this yeah. was sort of, they were, Make, they're sort of a brew pub. They don't brew it in their pub, but they, they were making all of their own beers from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I, having gone there the other night also, <laughs> earlier in the night, before yeah. I came to Veratino, I had their beers, decent beers. Their wings are really delicious. They're a gastro they pub. Yeah. Really delicious wings. Place. Absolutely. Yeah. Best wings I've had, certainly in the drove, not maybe even ever. They're really good yes. buffalo wings. <laughs> they have a lot a of good experience. stuff. Yeah. So one of the things they did in order to expand the beer production and the quality of the beer production, because in my personal opinion, when they started, their beers were really good, and then they started to go downhill a little bit, and I think they've come back, and they have a, a new in-house brewer. But one of the main things they did was they bought a brewery that was already existing, so now they have a more professional thing, and they're doing contract brewing for a lot of other brewers and stuff like that. Yep. And so that's how they took the advantage. They expanded their business by... Uh, by buying a brewery, it was Herzl Brewery. Herzl moved up to somewhere in the north, um, and so they bought in. They're, to my knowledge, the only brewery inside of Jerusalem itself. Wow. Okay. On a similar level, about business-wise, so this is one of the newest microbreweries in the country, Lodestone Beer. Um, they also are doing a lot of things. They, they focus on local flavors, so they're using a lot of fruits when they're in season to brew their beers. Oh wow! But they launched during Corona. <laughs> okay, so that's a wow. brand new brewery that opened. It wasn't their plan, obviously. Yeah. But that's what happened. Um, oh, I just want to show this one because this is another example of a, of a sour. So just to show that the sours have gotten popular, this is a company called Beard Sinut. So you hear the beer and Beard Sinut means serious, you know. <laughs> this is from the Arava, all the way in the south of the country. Uh, kibbutz Ketura. Uh, you, you may have heard of them. They're, they're uh, young Judea kibbutz, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, a really cool kibbutz. And uh, so this is located there, but this is one of their sour beers. You see it says uh, Finav Sour Beer. Nice. Um, staying on the business level, Shapira Beer. So this is one of the, one of the bigger microbreweries in the country and one of the earlier ones. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened with them is that actually during Corona, this is about a month ago, a month and a half ago, I want to say two months max. By the way, this is a TCI IPA. It is. Yes. I like it a lot, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so they're, uh, they are the first uh, craft brewery in the country that has, this only happened recently, within the last two months, they've been purchased by one of the majors here. Wow. So in brief, there, are, there were five breweries in this country before the first craft brewery, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay. That was 15 years ago, the first craft brewery. So before well, that, you it? had, yeah. Oh, wow. So before that, you had, um, you had first Nesher beer, uh -huh. which a lot of people know the non alcoholic, they have yeah. a real one. Uh -huh. And it's decent. Then you had Gold Star and Maccabi. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gold Star yeah. is acceptable, and Maccabi is terrible, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And then you had Two Berg and Carlsberg, which are Danish beers, but opened a local brewery in Ashkelon. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh. I mean, they do that in the States, too. A lot of like farm places oh, will yeah, have yeah. a local brewery. I just thought it was all imported. I had right. no idea so that's not. A lot of other farm beers here are imported. Those are brewed locally. Oh, wow. Okay. And that was it until the Dancing Camel opened. We'll talk about him in a minute. Okay. That was 15 years ago. Now you have all this. So these are one of the, the Dancing ones. Camel was the first? It was the first craft brewery in the country. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. I mean, there were a couple of brew pubs, but they were the first one that was like doing it for sale. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. So these guys were one of the earlier uh, microbreweries in the country, Shapira, and they were recently bought by, I think, Tempo, one of the major uh, beverage companies in the country. Oh, cool. Um, they still maintain control of the brewing process, mm -hmm. but they are majority owned. They're 51% sold to this thing. Okay. So it gives them an infusion of cash, of marketing, of distribution. And so they're the first one that has sort of had an exit, if you will, yeah. uh, <laughs> of, of that. Nice. And the last on the beers, uh, so this is uh, from the Dancing Camel. You can see, for those who are looking, there's a little Dancing Camel 
right there. Yeah. Nice place um, in Tel Aviv. Yeah, they have. The, so they were the first microbrewery 15 years ago. Really? 2000, uh, wait, 15 years ago? I think 15 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, wow. And they've been around for a long time, obviously, in terms of that. And they make some really interesting beers. They were started by an American named Dave Cohen. Uh -huh. um, and so in addition to their regular beers, and they also use a lot of local flavorings in their beers. Yeah. But this is an example of, uh, it says here, iced stout aged on bourbon French oak. So this is an oak aged beer. Now, wow. what's different about this? This is not the first year they made it. They do this uh, every year as a seasonal beer, yeah. but again, they needed to think about what's going on during Corona. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting as many people coming into their bar and stuff right. like that. And so this is the first time they've actually bottled it. Hmm. Um, and so that's, again, a shift during Corona. So all these things you see. And, it, and it's fancy. It's got wax on it, too. Yeah, you see that? It's wax fancy. on top. Yeah, well, that's maybe because of bourbon age. I want you to think of, uh, of uh, Maker's Mark, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's the one that has the yeah, wax yeah, on it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, That's so, a little bit about the beer. So for beer in Israel throughout the pandemic, so a lot of the breweries have switched to moving into packaged goods as opposed to just on-site sales, right? Yeah, and, and delivery model and yeah. and thinking about ways to get people to buy more by like creating new beers. Because obviously like the majority of the beer consumers are just gonna get the same stuff all the time. Uh, but the people that are passionate about beers, they get newer they, stuff. They're, they're like, uh, like I've had, and there and some really new cool stuff is right. Come and out. All those yeah. weird ones, I've tried them all because like, I'll try anything once. You know, I yeah. might not like it, and then I won't get it again. But like for example, I said the Alpacamel, the pickle one. I've had that. I've had that a few times already. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah, so that's an example um, of what's been going on with with beer in this country now. And and I have to say, of course, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I'm sure though that, that some of the microbrewers closed during the pandemic as well. Yeah. Um, it's also hard to know because of that because they're always opening and closing microbrews in this country because it's it's a difficult industry here. Yeah, be, yeah. Beer is not really the most prominent beverage of the country. It's, that's the first problem. Yes. Okay, the second problem right, is taxation. Just taxation factor. So taxation is a little bit of it, but I would say more more than just taxation. It's all of the business stuff. Mm -hmm. Basically. The many of the laws uh, affecting breweries and alcohol industry in this country are inadequate. Where they they basically don't know how to classify these things. They're not. And that, feels not sure like, they should, that feels like taxation is also related to that too. I'm saying taxation is for sure, but yeah. it's more than it's like it's like they'll make ridiculous requirements. They're like, is this industry? Is it agriculture? Is it food? And so you have like a tiny microbrewery that has two people working in it, but because they see it as a factory, you have to like. They, they make requirements of like the amount of space and, and a, a bathroom with a shower and stuff like that. And, like these are making wow. ridiculous financial requirements of these companies, oh, wow. even though they're a tiny company, because the laws haven't figured out how to recognize them. And then on top of all that, and this doesn't only affect beer; it affects all alcohol in this country. Yeah. Our alcohol consumption per capita is relatively low in this country compared oh. to many other countries. I'm not saying it's the lowest, but. Yeah. We're relatively low here. Right. Way lower than America or England or Germany for oh, sure. You could Way be, lower than France. Yeah, England is, yeah, is up there. Okay. England right. and Russia are up right. there. Right, well, I'm only talking about yeah, beer. But yeah, oh, oh beer, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about overall. So, so that, that <laughs> makes, that's already means you're starting into an uphill battle. Now, the flip side is it's gotten better. People are drinking more now than they used to. Mm -hmm. Going back to your earlier thing, Israelis travel, they right. are exposed to other, yeah. But it's a slow process. So all of those things mean that, that a lot of times microbrews will open and then close. And, and, you know, it is what it is. That's the nature of the business. Yeah. Hey there. I hope you've been enjoying this episode so far uh, featuring Joel Haber. I hope you come back for next week's episode. Don't worry. We still have plenty more of this episode still lit yet to go. But uh, next week's episode, uh, that's right, episode number 80, features, features Yissi Steinhardt, who is the cocktails columnist for Macher's Magazine. Here's a sneak peek. I would love just for everyone to understand that making yummy tasting drinks can happen at home mm. and you don't need all of these fancy things and you can still come out with a solid, delicious drink. I hope you enjoy that sneak peek into next week's episode number 80. And now back into this episode with Joel Haber. Behind us, we have this incredible, I mean, it's out of frame. You can't really see it. The entire wall is taken up by this really fantastic. Do you want to tilt or you do not want to deal with it? The what? Should we tilt it or no, you know? Oh, no, no. 
This fantastic M and H uh, whiskey distillery. M and H is an, it stands for milk and honey. Of course, this is the land of milk and honey. Eris Zabat Kalab Bash. Um, so this is a so moving on to whiskey. Right, so there's only what a few whiskey distilleries yeah, well, let's here. Let's talk about this. distilling in general, broader sure, yeah, just sure, beyond sure. the whiskey. Yeah. So yeah, so um, milk and honey, uh, which now I think officially changed into just M and H, but it is from milk and honey. Yeah. They're based in Yafo in Tel Aviv, okay. and uh, they were the first single malt style whiskey to market a number a few years back. The Golani Distillery in the Golan Heights, I believe, was the first whiskey to market. It wasn't a single malt yet at that point. Uh-huh. Uh, Scotch style whiskey, I mean. Yep. Um, so both of them, and they're very different from each other, but they both make interesting stuff. Um, so their mindset in general is very much like a like a startup mindset. Like they 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 do things in the idea of like iterations. You know, when like and and uh, what's the what's the what's the move term? fast and break things. Agile, agile, oh, agile. development. Okay. So like <laughs> they're they're constantly trying different things and tweaking and twying and, and they'll they'll do like three or four different versions in slight, like they'll age them in different areas at different elevations to see how different they are. Hmm. So they've continued with all of that throughout the pandemic, of oh, course, cool. and they've come out with new things um, as a way of doing that. But one of the things that I found really interesting that they did, do um, so you know how like, like if you walk into a grocery store in like June and you find something that says kosher for Passover, you're like, I don't want that, right? <laughs> Well, yeah. this is something that like you can drink right now that is made kosher for Passover. That is actually uh, year round alcohol. So this, uh, for those who are looking, is called Suf, like Yam Suf, the, the the Sea of Reeds, and they made this for Passover this year. I don't know if they exported it all to the states. They may have done a small export, but I hope they'll in the future. The second pandemic Passover. Correct. Yes. Correct. It's just this year's Passover. <laughs> so. Those who know about whiskey know that, like, really, what gives the whiskey the flavor is not the whiskey itself. That's pretty much neutral spirits. Yeah. What gives the whiskey the flavor is the casks that it's aged in, the barrels. Yeah. Right. So what they did was they took uh, a rum. Okay. I don't know how neutral of a flavor the rum was, but they took a rum, yeah. and they aged it in sherry casks. And because they're kosher and things like that, they aged them in kosher sherry casks. <laughs> and so this is not made from grain and therefore it is kosher for Passover and yet it tastes pretty much like a whiskey. I had it this year for Passover. It was excellent. I really enjoyed it. I'm not going to say it tastes like the best whiskey I ever had yeah. but it was better than any other for hard Passover liquor. Passover spirit. It's, you know. But I'm saying it's good enough that like when I did that talk here a few weeks ago yeah. this was one of the beverages that I served and pretty much everybody liked it. Wow. Nice. At the very least everyone was like impressed by it. <laughs> and most great. people liked it. So I think that's really cool. And this was something, I, I can't say it was because of the pandemic that they did it, but it did come out during the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, it's got this really cool Egyptian-inspired label. You can see Moses right down there. And it says <laughs> Passover spirit. So they yeah. got like Egyptian stuff over here. That's clever. Tzach Adash Bachav. Right. Rebbe Yehuda is mnemonic device. Yeah, the, the 10 plagues. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. So I would say, I hope that this gets exported next year also because really... I've not had anything of a hard alcohol variety on Passover that was better than this. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Like, in terms of hard alcohol. Like, yeah. normally what you get is you get, sometimes you'll get a rum, sometimes you'll get tequila, sometimes you'll get Arak. Yeah, yeah. And that's about it. Mm-hmm. This was really good and it tasted, wow. it, you could get cognac. This is, I would say, on par with cognacs in oh, terms of like its really interesting cool. flavor. So that yeah, was a really cool thing. Oh, wow. So whiskeys, aside from that, I mean, oh, I so should also, but it's not like, you know, it's, I think a, a sharp distinction between whiskey and beer during the pandemic is there's not a lot of on-premises, like people are coming in, Correct. hanging out, people buy a bottle and they take it home. Beer, there, that's a much more massive distinction pre-pandemic. Correct. Pandemic. Whiskeys, okay, fine. So that, you know, you're going to take a different, you know, product home. Yeah. Right? But what I will mention since we're on the topic of distilling is that we also have the newest distillery in the country, to my knowledge, opened also, I believe it opened during the pandemic, if not, then right before, which is right here in Jerusalem, we have Thinker's Distillery. I was passing by it today Did on you a not bus. go in? I was on a bus, a bus, and I saw it, and I, my eyes just looked at it, okay. and my wife was like, what are you looking at? And I'm like, it says distillery, and it, I was Well, like, we discussed it in our plans for the tour. Okay, okay but I, yeah. That's cool. So I saw it, I, I saw it on the bus line, okay. but 
Wow. So Thinker's Distillery is located here in Jerusalem. Yeah. Okay. They don't sell in stores and stuff like that, except for like one place because it's like his son's pizza place that they sell there. <laughs> um, but uh, they basically just sell at the distillery, maybe online, I don't know. Okay. They're making right now uh, vodka and I think two types of gin. Okay. And nice. in the works, they plan to be making, I believe, the first in Israel, a bourbon style whiskey. Ooh. Wow. Um, and one of the just. I don't think it changes very much, but it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. We were talking before about the water. Remember you said that? Yeah, water has an impact. So you know where they get the water for this? Where? Yeah. So there's an Israeli technology, I'm sure they're not the only ones, that actually is able to um, withdraw moisture from the air into drinking water, from oh, cool. the humidity in the air. Oh, nice. And they have a system, so when you drink their whiskey, you are actually drinking the air of Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem air water. For real, right? <laughs> wow. I'm not even joking. The water is taken from the air right outside of the distillery mm. and distilled into water. Not it, distilled, it like wisens condensed you. into it, water. It wisens you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's why it's called Thinkers. Ah. Oh, <laughs> so that's that really very cool. thoughtful. Yeah, right. so that's really cool. Okay. Also, I don't remember, it may have been during the pandemic that they released their whiskeys, but the Jerusalem distillery, which is the second newest distillery in the country, yeah. Um, their, I think their distiller is the same guy from Golani. I don't think he's okay. an owner. Maybe he's a part owner. I don't know. Yeah. Dave Zabel, another, I think he's a Canadian. I'm not sure. Canadian or American. Mm -hmm. um, and so their whiskey, which is a Scotch style whiskey, is a peated whiskey, which you don't yeah, have nice. in the others. So they're a different style of whiskey. Even though they're called Jerusalem Distillery, they're not located in Jerusalem. Oh, okay. They're, uh, they, they distill down in, uh, not far from Beit Shemesh. Okay. In Kibbutz uh, Tzora. Hmm. But, uh, so those were, they they existed as a distillery before, but I believe their whiskeys first came out. They were making like rums and gin and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that their whiskey also first came out during the pandemic. Okay. I mean wine. But wine right, probably hasn't really changed. Change. very much. Yeah, wine is just there, and it's not like, people, I mean, people may go to wineries or, or have on-premises sales, but I imagine for the most part, people buy wine, have whether at home, at meals, and obviously for Kiddush Hotel and other right. celebratory, you know, events. Right. I mean, I'm sure that they were affected by the pandemic. I'm sure that sales were affected to a degree. Yeah. Certainly, you know, a lot of them deal with tourists, and those weren't coming, so that was an issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think by and large, the wine industry more or less stayed the same. I'm sure there were some minor changes. Okay. So I don't think that's something that changed a lot, but, uh, you know, I live here in Jerusalem yeah. and I hang out a lot in the Shuk in uh, Machin Yehuda Market. Also, um, shout out to my wife, Machin Yehuda is my, her favorite place in the world. She loves going there. I, I, I heard a great quote once that I, I just repeat because it's a great, I, I think it's awesome. Yeah. When you come to Jerusalem, yeah. if you want to talk to God, you go to the Kotel, mm -hmm. the Western Wall. Yeah. And if you want to see God, you go to Machin. <laughs> That's good. It's great. But anyway, so like anybody who has been there on and off over the years has noticed that there's obviously been a major change over the last, let's say, 10 years with more and more eateries, but also the nightlife bars that have opened in the Shuk. And I, and I love that. You know, um, it's funny because even several years ago when I was here in 2017, I noticed not necessarily half, but a very significant portion of eateries offered at least a few beers on tap. Sure. And yeah. so I already was very noticeable. That, and that was years pr prior to the pandemic. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So the nightlife has been there for already a number of years, at yeah. least eight or nine years. Yeah. Um, and it's grown. And I love the show, so I'm not here to badmouth it, but I will say that what's happened with the nightlife there, I'm not, in the last, I'm talking during the pandemic, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's for the better. Okay. I, I don't hang well, I mean, look, as the, much the as the I The pandemic's obviously going to affect nightlife anywhere right. in the world, right? But what happened was that a lot of the, what I would consider, and this is a personal opinion, what I would consider the better bars yeah. didn't survive and okay. closed down specifically due to the pandemic. Yeah. And the bars that did survive were... Ones that I don't particularly like, gotcha. and not just because I just don't like them, but I feel like that the owners don't have respect for other people that work in the market, mm -hmm. and they're just very self-centered and self-focused, and, uh, and I feel that like the nightlife there that's there now is not the nightlife that was there even five years ago. And oh, so not even just pandemic versus pre-pandemic, but... A real well, it, was, it was a steady uh, progression, change. but <laughs> the difference is that five years ago, there may have been a bunch of those bars 
but there were still good ones. Mm -hmm. And now, except for maybe the Beer Bazaar, I don't think there's too many of the really good ones. There's a couple that are acceptable, yeah. but there's a lot more of these bars that I'm not particularly fond of. Okay. And uh, and I don't. I used to hang out there all the time, and uh, at night, at best, uh, I live right next to the show, so at best, I may take a beer from my refrigerator, walk into the open part of the market where it's less uh, anything and just drink it there and people watch. Yeah. But there's, I don't often go there anymore uh, in that sense. And that's the, sad, that's the sad side of what the pandemic did. How much of that is, is those owners creating? So I imagine also the, the, the quant, forgetting, setting aside quality for the moment, but even just the quantity of people going to frequent or otherwise, um, you know, Pay and, and be customers during the pandemic is also ra so that, radically dropped. Right? right, so that obviously hurt things uh, in the first year, let's say, not even full okay. year of the pandemic. Obviously, once we hit our vaccination campaign, and then gradually things opened up more oh, and more. Okay. So that's a big change by spring of 2021. Certainly by spring of 2021, yeah. yeah, things were pretty much back to normal here until yeah. now. Delta has now started to change in the back of it, but. But by then, like, like we were pretty open. We weren't 100%, but like, restaurants and bars, they were open again, and people were going out, you know? Mm -hmm. They didn't have the tourists, yeah. okay, which a lot of people get in Makani, but, but there was plenty of people like that, that the bars, they may have been hurt, but they were able to survive. Mm -hmm. But once the clothes closed in the earlier parts, uh -huh. but a lot of these guys that, that have these other bars, maybe they have money that they're bankrolling it with and therefore they can survive longer. Mm. Maybe it's because of their business model which is selling like watered down beer and therefore they make more money off of what they're selling and stuff like that. Sorry. <laughs> um, Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but I mean that is yeah, a sad yeah. thing and I hope that, that, that things will even out again. That some that there will be more good bars reopening there, I hope. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's the same everywhere. Um, I will say one thing that's happened, I don't think it's specific during the pandemic, but it survived it, is that we've seen a little uptick in like cocktail bars here in Jerusalem. Oh really? That was already a thing in Tel Aviv, and there was like one or two cocktail bars here, but there's been at least another two or three over the last uh, couple of years that have opened. Oh, wow. It's not specific to the pandemic, but it has happened. Yeah. The guys from Biratano here have a cocktail bar that's pretty much focused on gin, gin and tonics of various types and gin-based beverages called the rabbit hole. Really? So yeah, so there is some of them. Uh -huh. Hello, dear listeners. It's your host, Rabbi Drew. I uh, wanted to break in right now and just say, hey, a, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate or watching however you're consuming this content. And I'm always open for new ideas, both for specifically the Jewish Drinking Show, whether it's topics, whether it's guests. I'm also looking for other resources that I can provide you with in the Jewish Drinking Project more broadly. Also, you know, I'd really like to offer you the opportunity to, to sponsor this work. Whether If you want to go to patreon.com slash Jewish Drinking, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, if you have ideas for swag, also, please feel free to send them to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. All right. Thank you so much, L'Chaim. And now back into the episode. So that's definitely on the production side. I'm, I'm also curious, like, sort of in general, like, what have you... I mean, I, I, I started touching on this when it comes to Mount Yehuda, but also just sort of consumption patterns... Sort of, in, like I get on the production side, that's important, and thinking about the businesses, but also people in their own personal consumption predilections. Like, and what have you noticed? And obviously, there are different phases of the pandemic. Sure, too. it's hard to, it's hard, it's hard for me to know that because well, what we are seen somewhat separate. Witness because like, people are separate, you know. Right. Like, like although we do see each other, we do go out more than maybe. Facebook too. So yeah, so I don't know necessarily. I, I, I have not seen a specific. One specific to that, I've seen there are some people that are drinking more, and there's other people that are drinking less. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I think especially during the whole time when we were more not fully locked down, but when we were spending a lot more time inside and not going out and about like we are now, um, I myself I probably drank less because I've, I like I still drank, but like yeah. some people, you know, you heard about like that. That's all I did. They sat at home and drank. Yeah. You know. Um, I usually drink when I'm out. I still do, yeah. I do drink a little at home. But like yeah, I imagine a lot of people drink socially, whether it's for exactly. work mixers, whether it's whatever it was. Yeah, and like socially. and even Shabbat meals and having oh, yeah. fewer of those and stuff like yeah. that. So I would guess that like personally, I drank less during at least the first year of the pandemic. Yeah, but after but, the vaccinations and people talk exactly, more freely. Yeah. Exactly. So, but I, I don't think it's easy to make a generalization. I don't think there's any one uh, pattern that people here followed. 
Um, I think some people drank more, some people drank less. I think the delivery thing helped some people. Maybe some people shifted their what they drank. I, I, but I don't, I don't know that I saw one pattern. This is actually not new, but I just figured it'd be nice. And I guess in a way, uh, we can relate it both to Milk and Honey Behind Us and the other whiskey distillery I mentioned, Golani, because um, we're recording this before Rosh Hashanah. This will probably air after Rosh Hashanah, but uh, this was made by, by Golani, and it is a mead. Uh, med, as I used to pronounce it when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> honey beer, essentially, honey wine, various uh, types. There's actually a number of people making this. I had a really good one um, just uh, a few weeks ago. Some guy, he's like home brewing it in the gush somewhere. Um, but it was it was really nice. And this is one of the most ancient uh, beverages uh, and was made in, in this region. I think it's mentioned in, in the Talmud. Uh, it's called Temed is, uh, oh, really? is how it's used. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, I believe it's mentioned in the Talmud. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just figured honey, Rosh Hashanah, milk and honey, it's just an appropriate way to wrap it up, um, but it's on the shelf here at Biratano as well. Oh, and one last thing we didn't mention about Biratano yeah. that we should mention, sure. if we do the tour, which yeah. hopefully will happen, is that Schmultz uh, was involved, the brewer was involved with a really cool project, and hopefully, if all goes as planned, uh, when the tour happens, in March hopefully, Hopefully we'll come here and at the very least talk to him about it and maybe even get to taste it, if we can, yeah. which is uh, ancient beer. Basically, uh, in real brief, uh, basically they, you know, were the country of archaeology. And so they, <laughs> they took shards of pottery uh, that held beer 2,000, 3,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, about 3,000 years ago, from various locations in the country. And scientists were able to isolate the yeast strains, specific yeast strains that were used for beer back then. And then Schmultz, basically uh, in partnership with them and in contract with them, made beer and mead using that yeast, which is really cool. Yes, yeah, impressive. Um, and, and we do similar things with wine here. Um, one of the one of the newest uh, trends, let's say, it's not yet big enough, but something that's been going on for about a little less than 10 years now, I think maybe seven or eight years now, yeah. is, so you know our wine industry here in this country is incredible and really good quality, but one thing that's different is we don't have a distinctive local style. Mm -hmm. So one of the things they've done is that there's a guy named Shivy Drury, Drury who is the, uh, I believe the owner, certainly the winemaker of uh, Gvaot Winery. Okay. He also is an agronomist and teaches in Ariel University, and he identified something like, I don't know, a huge number of strains of local indigenous grape varieties from this country. Oh, cool. Most of them are not the type that you can make wine out of, they're mostly table grapes, but there's been a few that they've identified. Mm -hmm. And so now there's about four or five wineries that make wines out of these grapes. They're not great yet, yeah. but hopefully with more years of experience over that. And so these two things remind me of a poster that I had in my basement in New Jersey growing up. <laughs> yeah. It was an Israeli like tourism poster. Have you seen it? had like a broken pottery shard, an ancient pottery shard, and in the middle of it, it had this like high tech for them, like glass beaker with this blue liquid inside. <laughs> and the slogan said, Israel, our future is where our past is. Okay. And that's exactly what this beer and what this wine is doing. <laughs> that's really neat. So yeah, really not great. specific to the pandemic, but it's uh, really cool. Well, it's Israel. one thing to learn about the past, it's another thing to taste the past. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, yeah it's been, this has been really great. This has been really great. So, Joel, thank you for so much for this presentation. Do you have anything you'd like to promote? Oh, <laughs> well, I think I did at the beginning, but just in case not. This is, this is a um, special promotion. Item. So, uh, <laughs> if anybody is coming to visit this country anytime in the future, I'm a tour guide. You can reach me via my tourism website, which is fjisrael.com. That's like for fun Joel, which is my nickname. So, fjisrael.com. And uh, I'm also, in terms of the Jewish food history stuff, coming to the States October, November, you can find my blog about Jewish food history at tasteofjew.com. And uh, a really easy to remember email address is jewishfoodbook at gmail.com. That's for any of the Jewish food history stuff. Awesome. 
All right. And to promote our upcoming tour in yes. March. Amen. All right. Well, Joel, this has been really great. Thank Pleasure. you so much. And finally, Lachaim. Oh, I'm empty, bro, but Lachaim. Woo! <laughs>